Okay, we on? Okay. All right, everyone. Let's get started for the second session, which is planets themselves. Uh, my name is Stephen Kane, and uh, I'll be moderating this session. So uh, welcome back, everyone, and welcome uh, everybody who's uh, online watching over the live stream. Uh, so I'm, I'm starting with a, a, a very weird kind of uh, poll about just your own subjective opinion on which planet in the solar system uh, you think might be most interesting to study further in the context of exoplanets. And you can't see all the options there, but if you look online or on your app, you can see all of the planets listed there. But while you guys are, are doing that, I'll just introduce myself a little bit further. I've been studying uh, exoplanets for about 25 years, and I spend most of my time now thinking about planetary habitability. But the interesting part was that I remember back in 95 when we were first starting to find exoplanets, and as stellar astrophysicists, which is what many exoplanet folks are, uh, especially back then, what we would do is we would detect an object and we would infer that, that that object is there. And the best we could say is, well, it probably doesn't burn deuterium, so we're going to call it a planet. That was the limit of our expertise on planetary science. However, over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, we're living in extraordinary times because especially with missions like Kepler and various other ground-based experiments probing down into the terrestrial planet regime, it became clear very quickly that we did need to adopt the expertise of our planetary science colleagues. And so what we're witnessing today is a merging of those fields and a sharing of that expertise between geophysicists, planetary scientists, exoplanet folks, and it's, it's leading on extraordinary pathways. So we have assembled a great panel uh, for you all today uh, who span a variety of expertise in planetary atmospheres and, and solar system science and geophysics. And we're going to discuss some of these issues. So before we do that, let's go back to our poll. Oh my goodness, everybody's been very anthropic about the poll. <laughs> Earth. And Earth and Venus. So, of course, one thing to keep in mind is that the question from this poll is, is very ill-posed. It is uh, very subjective because it depends on what science question you're trying to answer. If you're interested in what the occurrence rate of Jupiter-like planets are or the effect that Jupiter has had on the, on the delivery of volatiles to the planets in our solar system, you might say Jupiter. If, however, you do, like many people appear to uh, feel from this poll, that the focus really is on Earth-sized planets, then understanding the dichotomy uh, in atmospheric evolution that we've seen on Earth and Venus is obviously very, very important. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to uh, move to our panel, but I do invite all of you uh, to, to submit your questions and uh, we'll go through as many of them as we can. All right, so I shall hand it over to our first, Leslie. Great. So good morning, everyone. My name's Leslie Rogers. I am an assistant professor at the University of Chicago, and I study the interior structure and evolution of exoplanets. And so uh, to introduce this panel, I'd like to start with this images that we're all familiar with from our astronomy textbooks of all the various planets in the solar system. And even among these eight planets, there's a tremendous variety and diversity in almost every property, be it their uh, appearances, which we can see, their masses, their sizes, their atmospheres. And of course, now with exoplanets, uh, it, they're filling in the gap it's among these various samples that we are familiar with from the solar system. Now, the study of exoplanets as planets themselves does pose some challenges compared to the study of solar system planets in the sense that we do typically have coarser information, fewer observables, and that are typically less precise. But exoplanets also offer tremendous opportunities to study extreme outliers that as individual case studies push our understanding of planets and planet formation in new, in, uh, new areas. 
And also, exoplanets offer us the opportunity to study statistical samples of planets, to really understand the trends and to sample the statistical outcomes of planet formation. And so uh, work is already ongoing to characterize the census of exoplanets and to start to disentangle from the observed properties, such as mass and radius and orbital period, what might the nature of the planets that we're seeing be? Are the planets in the super-Earth sub-Neptune size range scaled up rocky planets, scaled down many Neptunes, water worlds, or other uh, varieties of planets that we have yet to imagine? And so looking ahead to the future, as we continue to accumulate larger and larger numbers of planets, and as the precision on their measured properties continues to improve, we can expect to have more and more discriminating power to try to identify uh, various trends and subpopulations of planets that may have formed through various different planet formation pathways. Now, this is kind of ongoing and near future, so I'd like to just make a couple comments about looking ahead in a more optimistic and bold view what additional observational insights can we expect to bring to bear to complement uh, the work that's ongoing today? And so one area that I am very excited about and that will be touched upon in, uh, by the uh, upcoming panelists is the connection between planet interiors and their atmospheres. And so this uh, has a bearing on kind of identifying the nature of planets in that enigmatic sub-Neptune super-Earth size range. Um, and for rocky planets, there are, uh, we'd love to know more about the range of possible outgassed atmospheres. For the Neptunes and giants, though, it would be wonderful to explore how interior processes can manifest themselves in the atmospheres. How might partitioning at various phase boundaries within the planet interior have consequences for the planet atmosphere? Uh, will we be able to identify whether Neptunes and Jupiters have significant quantities of ices and water within their interiors by studying uh, the abundances of trace elements in their atmospheres? And so to accomplish this, we would require uh, more detailed studies of the phase uh, diagrams and equations of states, not just for pure materials, but of mixtures, such as hydrogen and water, and even water and carbon monoxide. Another exciting opportunity, looking even further to the future, would be the possibility for observational constraints on the magnetic field strengths of exoplanets. And so if we were able to detect the presence or strength of a, of a planetary scale magnetic field, that gives us information about the interior thermal evolution and state of the planet's interior that we really can't get any other way. And that would give us an additional uh, dimension of characterization that can, may help kind of inform our ideas about the habitability of planets, but also help us distinguish and further uh, constrain the possible uh, interior structures, bulk compositions, and natures of those planets. Thank you. Now we'll move on to Cayman. Well, while that's coming up, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Cayman Unterborn. I'm a research scientist at Arizona State University in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. Um, I'm a geophysicist by training, but I've done everything from stellar uh, abundance measurements to uh, interior dynamics models, mineralogy, all sorts of things. I'm, I really like to, and I, 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 in this talk, I can hopefully show that that kind of broad thinking is what really is going to motivate exoplanets, I hope, in the next um, 
50 to 100 or however long. And so uh, we're taking a step down, we're looking at, I'm gonna be talking about the rocky planets themselves. And I, I think it's important, especially in broad talks like these, to think about what's the motivation for why we're all talking about exoplanets all week. And so I actually pulled it down from the NASA website. Um, and I, I highlighted the, the primary goal for exoplanet exploration, according to NASA, is, and I really wanna highlight these two words, is to discover and characterize uh, planetary systems and Earth-like planets. And so this, at the test meeting, you've had a whole week of learning about how to discover them. And I think the new aspect of exoplanet uh, science that was mentioned in the previous panel as well is characterizing. And not in, in a later panel, you'll hear about the system architecture, but I wanna speak specifically about the geology. And so when I read this question, I, I think of an even bigger thing is, what does it even mean to be an Earth-like planet? And I think different fields have different definitions of this. Is it just a one Earth mass planet with a one Earth radius around a G-type star? Um, or is it something more broad? But respecting that this is an astronomy community, I think you can also ask, well, what targets should I look at? Where should I point my telescope is kind of how it's always phrased. And so when I think of an Earth-like planet as a geologist, I think of it as kind of a combination of four things. Uh, the composition of a planet, and I've kind of put broad analogs of the solar system that I think these might be important for. So composition, Mars, as an iron, uh, lots of iron oxide, dynamics, the Earth has plate tectonics. It's the only planet we know that has it. Um, history, why is Venus the way it is? And structure, Mercury has a big core. How did it get that? And of course, these things are all intermingled, but in a broad sense, this is how I define them. And what we really wanna know in an Earth, what Earth-like means, if you have an Earth-like planet, does that actually lie, and of course it's messed up, but does this lie at a knife edge in this Venn diagram where you have only, a very specific parameters being met, and therefore you have an Earth-like planet, or what I would find much more exciting as someone who studies planetary interiors, is is there a broad, blurry definition of Earth-like? And of course, I don't know what that is, and really, it's because we don't have a definition for Earth-like, and if there's anything I think can come out of meetings like these, and what we should be talking about for the next 50 years, is trying to define what, what we actually mean from Earth-like. But again, it's important to take stock, I'm a theorist, I think, um, what exactly are we going to observe and test these things? And really, oh, it fixed, uh, is gonna be down to composition. So whether we get this from mass radius or we infer it from stellar abundances or other things, the only aspect we're going to directly observe about an exoplanet is its composition and its orbital period and aspects of its atmosphere. So we're going to have to infer everything from the dynamical state, the history, the structure from very few observables, and that's, Sounds scary, but it's not. I don't think it is. I think it's a wonderful challenge. And so from that, you've got to define Earth-like in a very limited observational context. You have to define things like planetary segregation. How does the core form? The mineralogy of that planet, which is something close to my heart. The geodynamic state, does it convect? Does it conduct? Um, and then at the top of, of the heap is the carbonate silicate cycle, climate stability, life, habitability, these kinds of questions. Again, from very limited observables. And so when you ask me, given all those complexities, what's the target list, what catalog should I make from those limited observables, I don't know. I would say go look at the Earth, because that's the planet that does it best. But uh, we really, that's a bit too easy of an answer. We should think a bit more broadly. So, I, I've decided, uh, and of course the font, it messed up again, but um, I've decided that this is a question I think is wor worthy of being tackled in the next 50 to 100 years, is if you really wanna understand Earth-like, what makes the Earth really unique is plate tectonics. So what targets are more or less likely to have plate tectonics? I think that's a question that spans all of the fields that are, go, into geo, uh, go into exoplanet science. And so I can't begin to answer that question, but that may be something we should shoot for. And so my main goal in all of this is that to define Earth-like, and it was mentioned in the last panel, is requiring a vast level of interdisciplinarity that has never, I don't think, happened before. So fields that have been so far aflung for so long, astronomy, geoscience, that have maybe mingled with plan in planetary science, are now being forced together to try to understand exoplanets. And so I drew this Venn diagram very purposely to kind of showing them just now starting to come together. And so 
this coming back to this discover and characterize, this is not necessarily independent fields. It's actually a d dialogue and a discussion that needs to happen from everything from mission concept levels to experiments that we do in the lab on Earth, whether that's in a geoscience or a biology lab or um, astrophysics lab. And you know, these are really fun questions from a geo perspective I can think of. Magnetic fields, as Leslie mentioned, how common are continents? That's something that also makes the Earth really unique. Planetary age is something I don't think we talk about a lot, but to a geodynamicist, that means a lot. Volcanism, we're gonna be measuring gases in um, an atmosphere. Where did they come from? What, are the what kind of volcanoes produce that? We don't know. We have a sense for the Earth, but we, once we move beyond the Earth and compositions that are not Earth-like at all, which I would say most planet, exoplanets are probably not Earth-like, um, what do they, how do they behave? What do they look like? And I, I think that leads nicely into what Ollie will talk about. Thank you, Chairman. Over to Oliver. Thanks. So I'm a, a geoscientist by training at the University of Cambridge, and I uh, work between the astronomy and earth science departments, uh, thinking about planetary processes on a, in a, in a large scale, and uh, recently in the context of exoplanets. And what I want to do is uh, initially pose kind of a somewhat provocative question, perhaps, um, using this beautiful image. So we're looking across a, a dry, dusty landscape on a, on a beautiful, sunny day. Um, and if you were standing there, one of the first things you'd notice is the, the tenuous CO2-dominated atmosphere that was making uh, life a little bit difficult for you. Um, with more detailed observations, if you look closely, if you'd uh, taken your Geology 101, you'd possibly notice the fine laminations in these foreground sediments, indicative possibly of uh, water, uh, water vein deposition of, this, of these sediments. And ultimately, if you, if you drilled the rock and looked at the mineralogy, you may find evidence for hydrous mineral phases in those rocks. So the actual mineralogy of the rocks is, uh, themselves, as well as their gross structure, indicative of water having been present on the surface of this planet. And so these are all observations uh, made by um, Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars over the last few years, obviously at great expense, and after decades of research into, into Mars, and you know, representing a culmination of enormous technical ingenuity. And the question I would pose is, what then is the point or the hope of, um, of exoplanetary sciences, given you know, the great lengths we've gone to to make in a sense, some relatively simplistic observations of a very nearby planet, what can we hope to learn um, about planets more generally looking outside the solar system? And I would answer that with two points. I think there's two, at least, if not many more, key things that looking at exoplanets can, can cr contribute to understanding um, small planets in particular. And the first one is this point which actually came up in the first um, panel discussion, which is about time travel which is to say that a huge amount of effort in the geosciences over you know, its, its century or two of existence as a subject has gone into trying to reconstruct the history of our planet. But unfortunately, we have to do that most of the time through the rock record, which is an incredibly indirect probe of Earth's past. It's, like, it's a terrible historian. It's a terrible recorder of time and past states of our planet, which means that actually, you know, going back even a few million years, let alone 100 million years, let alone a billion years, you know, key properties of our planet become increasingly uncertain. So, so what I would suggest is actually exoplanets at a very basic level, by sampling planets at, at different points in their state of evolution, obviously on the, on the left-hand side we've got the extreme kind of post-formation state of a sort of magma ocean world, but you could imagine that's a tidally heated or close-in exoplanet with a thicker atmosphere that's sort of trapped in a perpetual magma ocean state. Well, that's perhaps a regime that Earth and you know, terrestrial planets in our solar system went through transiently, and we can now study exoplanets trapped in that regime. And equally, came and brought up plate tectonics. Um, you know, plate tectonics may have arrived late on Earth. Um, how late, we don't know. We could, by sampling many more planets, we can begin to time travel um, through the evolution of terrestrial planets and begin to see how they, they evolve. And that's something we cannot do looking just at Earth or just at a few planets in the solar system. Exoplanets really is the solution to that um, via populations. The second thing is, is testing fundamental concepts in geology using exoplanets. So I, this is a beautiful image of the, of the Bengal fan uh, discharging huge volumes of sediment into the Indian Ocean, kind of building out this, this delta in, into the Indian Ocean. And I chose this image because this represents, this, this image of these sediments entering the Indian Ocean represents the end point of a thousand kilometer long 
chemical factory, which has been weathering rocks on the Himalaya, transporting them in, um, along, along the river system, ultimately into, into the Indian Ocean, and a whole while chemically altering them. And you know, at the heart of our understanding of Earth's long-term climate and its stability, and possibly that of exoplanets in the context of the habitable zone, is this idea that carbon dioxide can react with rocks um, be drawn out of the atmosphere and locked away in sediments, kind of thereby regulating Earth's, Earth's climate. But we really, there are some really fundamental questions about how that works, and even whether it does work on Earth, or whether actually there's some contrivance of other geochemical processes going on. And exoplanets, by looking at their atmospheres, in particular by looking at the carbon dioxide content of their atmospheres, and associating it that, that with the distance they are from their host star, may well allow us to test what are fundamental um, theories in the geosciences about how planetary climates are regulated. So that's incredibly exciting. Then finally, I want to kind of look more into the future and this possible future when we have a, a handful of choice exoplanets, choice ter terrestrial exoplanets in the, in the nearby galaxy, which may be amenable to detailed follow-up. And so the image I've chosen for this is this beautiful um, space shuttle image looking at the limb, uh, Earth's kind of, looking through the, the limb of Earth into its atmosphere following the Pinatuba eruption in the early 1990s. And what we see are these aerosol layers um, put into the atmosphere from this large volcanic eruption. And so this led to a huge perturbation of, of Earth's climate following the eruption, cooling the planet by half a degree for a couple of years. And this reflects the kind of the geological activity and time dependence of the planet. So this is looking forward that perhaps when we've got these juicy exoplanets to really dig into and study, maybe we'd like to transition from discovery to characterization to in-depth characterization, long-term monitoring of those few that look the most amenable to hosting geology and hosting life. And that's incredibly exciting. Thank you, Oliver. Over to Sarah. Thanks. Uh, my name is Sarah Hurst. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I'm mostly interested in studying atmospheric chemistry, particularly interested in um, processes that lead to haze formation, um, and also just interested in organic molecules wherever you might find them, um, not necessarily in an atmosphere. Um, I'm a planetary scientist by training, which is kind of a rare thing to be um, in a field where people do planetary science. <laughs> um, and so what I kind of wanted to just talk about a little bit today um, is, you know, in general talking about planetary atmospheres, but, you know, the the process of being a planetary scientist, what we're doing is turning points of light into worlds. And that's what exoplanets are starting to be able to do now with all the beautiful observations that are getting made. Um, we've been doing that in the solar system now for about 50 years. And so we've actually learned some things. Um, but we have some really big outstanding questions that we still struggle with. And so I think that's one of the things that's going to be really amazing um, about exoplanets to help us figure out how planets work. And so I picked two pairs of worlds. Um, I'm not just interested in planets, but also moons, um, that I put on this slide just with the question, why? Um, and the reason for that is that the two pairs of worlds that I chose to kind of highlight um, are fairly similar in size and located in the relatively similar region of the solar system where you start to do astronomer math to say that Ganymede and Titan are in the same part of the solar system, but <laughs> close enough. Um, and the reason why I wanted to point these two, these two pairs of worlds out is that we don't understand why these worlds are so different. So Ganymede and Titan are almost exactly the same size. Ganymede has no atmosphere. Titan has one and a half bar atmosphere. We don't know why. Um, Ganymede also has a magnetic field, and Titan does not. Don't know why. Um, Venus and Earth, very, you know, very similar locations in the solar system, very similar sizes, and yet they've clearly experienced extremely different evolutionary histories. And we don't know if that's to do with original starting conditions, if there were things that happened at some point in the history that caused that. Um, Venus has a, doesn't have a magnetic field, Earth does. Again, they're the same size. Their atmospheres are very, very different. And so um, this kind of gets us back to some of the big picture questions I think we have left over um, after 50 years of trying to figure out um, planetary atmospheres in the solar system. And for me, that kind of comes down to, um, one, how do planets get atmospheres? We don't know. Um, and, and because we don't know that, we don't actually know what determines a planet's atmospheric composition. And so we don't know why Earth has a nitrogen-dominated atmosphere. We have a lot of ideas about that, um, but we don't actually know. We don't know how Titan got its atmosphere. We have some, some thoughts about it, but a lot of big outstanding questions. And so we don't know how they get atmospheres. 
And we have a lot of ideas about how we lose atmospheres, but not a lot of opportunities to test how those processes work. And both of those things are really important for understanding the current state of the atmosphere for any planet that we're trying to study. It's gonna be really important for some of the topics that came up um, in, the, in the first panel, um, looking for biosignatures, things like that. Like we really need to understand not just the current state, the snapshot that we have, um, but also where we started and where we're going. And I think that's gonna be a place where exoplanets are gonna be so, so important for helping us answer these questions. It's come up already a couple times on our panel and it came up um, in the first panel this morning, but this ability to kind of time travel, to look at planets that haven't already undergone four and a half billion years of evolution is going to be really important for understanding how planets get atmospheres. Um, which I think is gonna be really amazing. And we've also seen so already seen some really um, interesting results in terms of understanding how planets lose atmospheres. So this um, paper that just came out looking at hydrodynamic escape, um, I think is so exciting. We have you know, all of this math understanding hydrodynamic escape, but we've never really gotten to like really, really test it. And so we're getting to that point now with these, um, with these amazing observations that are being made of exoplanets to see these things happening in real time um, and be able to start to use that to test the, the ideas that we you know, kind of formed um, from studying places in the solar system, but never really got a chance to test. Um, and the other reason that exoplanets are gonna really help us with that is just having expanded the phase space. There are flavors of atmospheres we do not have in the solar system that we think exist. And it's really hard to test our understanding of the chemistry that will happen in those types of atmospheres, the dynamics that will happen when we don't actually have any examples of those places. And so um, I'm really excited about that. Um, the flip side of that um, is that there are going to be a lot of challenges in understanding exoplanet atmospheres that I hope the solar system can at least um, provide some cautionary tales for. Um, and in my mind, one of the biggest challenges that we're going to have with exoplanets, and it's gonna be a huge challenge in terms of trying to understand whether or not a planet has um, biosignatures, however you wanna define that, is that we're not gonna know the boundary conditions. And that's something that has been really challenging for us in the solar system. Sean brought up Titan during the, um, during the first panel, and it was everything I could do to not just start screaming, go dragonfly, so I'm gonna do it right now, go dragonfly. Um, <laughs> yay. Um, but Titan, I think, is a really good example of this point about um, boundary conditions, and, and Sean actually mentioned a, a specific issue um, that I've spent a lot of time working on. And we had you know, measurements from Voyager that we could not explain for 30 years. And people definitely you know, occasionally wondered, like, is this carbon monoxide that we see in Titan's atmosphere, is that a biosignature? Like, that is a conversation that definitely happened. And it turns out what we were missing is that Enceladus is shooting a bunch of water into Titan's atmosphere, and that forces the chemistry in a very specific direction. But we didn't know that until Cassini got there. We had already sent one spacecraft to the Saturn system, and we didn't know that. It was only the second time that we, or I guess the third or fourth time, depending how you want to count the other ones, that we, that we found that out. And that completely changed our understanding. But even further to the, to the point that Sean made um, in that case is that if Enceladus was putting more water into Titan's atmosphere, Titan would have more CO2 in its atmosphere. And so that ratio is very strongly controlled by exactly how much water is coming out of Enceladus. And so that's something that is really challenging. And I was so glad that the first panel really talked about this idea of you know, there being strength in numbers. And so you know, maybe not every Titan has an Enceladus. And so as long as every Titan doesn't have an Enceladus, it's okay that we don't know that. It's just that we're going to have to be very, very careful when thinking about the chemistry happening in these atmospheres because we don't know the boundary conditions. And I think that's something really, really powerful that we've already learned from the solar system. And we need to make sure that we don't forget that lesson now going forward and trying to understand these atmospheres. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, so before we go to the questions, I just want to make it clear that I know it looks like I'm just sitting here checking my email, <laughs> but, but, but I am actively moderating uh, the questions coming in, so I hope that addresses the snarky email I just got from Diana Dragony that suggested that's what's going on. <laughs> Some of us also have our phones so we can see the questions because we can't see them very well. <laughs> Okay, so where I want to start um, is uh, with uh, something that Leslie brought up, because uh, Leslie, your, your mention of magnetic fields uh, provoked many questions <laughs> okay. from the audience. Uh, and uh, I had put one in there earlier about how our lack of 
being able to detect the magnetic field may inhibit our uh, interpretation of interiors and habitability. Uh, but I've highlighted this question uh, at the top, which is asking what is the best, most robust way to measure the uh, magnetic field of exoplanets? There have been many questions al along those lines. Yeah, so let me just briefly summarize some of the approaches that have been taken to date. Um, one approach that I'm very excited about is radio aurora. It's not yet, um, to my knowledge, constrained the magnetic field strength of an exoplanet, but it has been used to make, measure the magnetic field strength of brown dwarfs, and that's some work that Melody Cow uh, has done. Um, and then, so in terms of applying that towards smaller planets, um, that's a challenge. Um, all of the solar system planets do emit radio aurora, but the aurora emissions by the Earth are at long enough wavelengths, low enough frequencies that they are below the ionospheric cutoff. So uh, the previous panel mentioned putting a telescope on the moon and putting some sort of a big radio antenna array for long wavelength radio on the moon or in space would probably be what you would need um, to uh, have the sensitivity with that particular mechanism, uh, that particular approach of radio aurora uh, to constrain the magnetic field strengths of Gauss or sub-Gauss scale magnetic fields that uh, if uh, it, the Earth's magnetic field is typical of rocky planets with magnetic fields, that's what you would need. Um, recently, there was also a, a paper using um, star planet interactions to place constraints on the magnetic field strengths of hot Jupiters. And so that's another uh, avenue. Um, how much that would actually translate to smaller planets is, um, it would be a challenge, but I don't want to be pessimistic when looking ahead uh, kind of 30 or 40 years in the future. Um, and people have also made attempts um, by characterizing kind of asymmetric transit shapes, claiming evidence of kind of an, from an early ingress um, of potential detection of hydrogen that's kind of at a bow, bow shock or a bow shock. Um, and so there's some possibility in kind of the morphologies of material escaping from planets that you could also indirectly constrain magnetic field strengths. But at this point, attempts are, uh, uh, cl claim detections are at the brown dwarf and giant planet scales, and it's definitely something to look forward to in the future and to work hard on to how we might potentially be able to extend that down towards lower mass planets. Cayman, how important is it to your work, for example, do you use uh, can you use magnetic fields as a prior for uh, constructing the interior models, or is it an output of those derivations? So uh, not necessarily is it an output or an input, but from a geophysicist perspective, I see it as a heat flow problem. And so if you even sense a magnetic field as on or off, yeah. um, the fact that it is on instantly constrains something about how heat is moving out of the core of that planet. And that is a very important thing for understanding the dynamic state of that planet. And, and in fact, you, you would know, a consider, you would know, it would be an amazing measurement from a geoscience perspective to actually know if there's a magnetic field or not. So from interiors models right now, about all we can tell you is the size of the core. Um, I can't really tell you how the heat flow is coming out of that core because I have to make many assumptions about its history, how much heating it started with, how much radionuclide abundances does it have. You have to make many assumptions to run a dynamics model. But if I have a measurement that says it, it is dynamic, that's a, that's a very big constraint. Thank you. I'll tell and you thoughts? whether it's convecting or not, yeah, essentially, yeah, exactly. is what it boils down to. Oliver. Yeah, and one of the really exciting, kind of come back to this theme about what exoplanets can teach us about kind of fundamental properties and uh, evolutionary tracks of planets is that we don't know the, the detailed history of Earth's own magnetic field. Its strength in the, in the distant past is, is essentially unknown, um, or at least 
you know, uh, controversially constrained by observations. So uh, again, like having a population of exoplanets, if one day we do indeed get observations of their magnetic field, is going to suddenly tell us something uh, very important about the ubiquity of planetary magnetic fields and their persistence over long time scales, and possibly also the mechanisms, the mechanisms by which they emerge. Because I think, yeah, it's clearly a heat, it's a heat flow problem, but then there are there are details hidden in there about exactly how that's realized in terms of generating the ge geodynamo, so that's really exciting. I mean, in terms of the, hab the question, like the link to habitability, which I think maybe you raised as well, that's also a kind of interesting um, question, and I, I would almost want to turn that on, on its head as well. It's not, again, a priori immediately obvious what the, the significance of having the magnetic field is for, for habitability, and it would be it would be nice to be able to turn the question around and say, well, given we've discovered um, atmospheres on these, these N worlds and they, they happen to not or all have magnetic fields, then that actually informs us kind of empirically about the relationship between magnetic fields and atmosphere survivability and then potentially ultimately abiogenesis and the emergence of life. Uh, Sarah, you also mentioned magnetic fields in that uh, Titan does not and Ganymede does. Uh, yeah. Is there a pathway towards result, because you, you said that's a big unknown, so it can, what, what's the pathway towards solving that and how can we relate that to terrestrial Right, planets? so I think, I mean, it's kind of the points that everybody's brought up already, right? It's a, it, it tells you something about the interior, although, you know, then that kind of brings up these questions that we have about why, why Ganymede, why Titan, et cetera. Um, and also, you know, for me, I think one of, the, one of the things that will be really interesting to figure out is, you know, what role magnetic fields play in the retention of an atmosphere. Um, and I think that's important because, you know, we don't know if a magnetic field is required for, for a planet to be inhabited or not, um, but we actually don't even really know if it, if it um, is really that important for a, for a planet maintaining its, its, its atmosphere. I mean, our, our story that we tell ourselves with Mars is that Mars lost its atmosphere when it lost its magnetic field. Um, but at the same time, Venus doesn't have one. And Venus has, you know, is perfectly content to have an extremely thick atmosphere. Obviously, they're different sizes, and so maybe that's the answer. Um, but it would be, you know, really, really great to have a whole host of, of planets, some of which have atmospheres, some of which have magnetic fields, some have both, to really help us, you know, finally sort out this question about how these two things are related, and then going forward from that, how that plays into whether or not a planet could actually support life. So what I want to do now is, is move to a different question, which has uh, been at the top. And this one's from Johanna. And uh, this is essentially asking each of you, what is your dream data or instruments that uh, you would need to pursue the science questions you're trying to answer? I, I can start with that. Uh, so <laughs> with jo especially from Johanna, I would love uh, a spectrograph that can measure really precise abundance measurements, and then have mass and radius for that planet. And if it's rocky, we can begin testing some of our simple assumptions of how well stellar composition reflects planetary composition, or if the fact that they are different tells us something about the formation pathway of that planet. Um, and so even if it's something as simple as the iron to magnesium abundance, which maybe can tell us something about the size of the core, that is something that should manifest in a mass radius model. And so it, it'll be coarse, but with enough data points, we might be able to actually test that and look for outliers or just see if our hypothesis that they're one-ish to one-ish is, uh, is apt, is, is true. Wow. Um, I guess I already mentioned a radio <laughs> antenna array on the moon or in space. So another top priority would be uh, again, a very stable spectrograph, and the data analysis techniques that would allow us to measure the masses of planets, Earth's mass scale planets in the habitable zone of G stars. So really pushing radio velocities or astrometry uh, to the extreme uh, to enable us to measure masses of small planets on more distant orbits from their star and to be confident or at least be able to quantify our confidence that we're detecting a planet and not some stellar activity. I think, yeah, from, from my perspective, and this is maybe a slightly different take, is 
um, all these technologies would be incredible. Um, I would be interested, in, this is maybe in, again in the kind of far future now, it would be interesting to see those technologies dedicated to persistent monitoring of some of the most exciting objects or objects. So I think we have the prospect of um, Louvoir 7D. That's been the prediction for where we're going to find uh, the first no. biosignature. So we're gonna, <laughs> let's, let's hold us to that. Um, I'd like to see you know, Louvoir 7D sciences emerge. So earth sciences, Louvoir 7D sciences, and maybe there's blah, 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 XY sciences as well. So you know, these, these key objects for which a few of the most kind of high value assets are, are dedicated to persistent monitoring. And we do see, we see weather on them, we see climate, we see decadal scale evolution of those systems. Um, you know, that would be for me in you know, several de end decades time, that would be a really exciting future um, for, the, for the subject. And I know you're already very excited about dragonflies. Yeah, so <laughs> so uh, I was just thinking I must be the luckiest person on stage um, <laughs> because the thing that I uh, the thing that I want um, want, want most is actually uh, maybe going to really happen. Um, so obviously it's still just on paper, um, but I think uh, you know the measurements that we're going to do with dragonfly um, are really going to help us understand Titan better as a world. Um, so, you know, the thing I want to know most is, is to do with the complexity of the organics that are produced in Titan's atmosphere. We have, you know, data from Cassini that tells us that there are, there are ions, you know, a thousand kilometers above the surface that have a mass of, a mass to charge of 10,000 AMU, which is, you know, on the order of seven or 800 carbon atoms if they're composed entirely of carbon. And we don't know what they're made out of. We have no measurements. And so that material ends up on the surface. We're going to go collect it. We're going to measure it. We're going to put it in a state of our mass spectrometer and figure out what it's made out of. Um, but we're also going to get much better measurements of noble gases, which are going to help us understand um, both Titan's formation history, but also its evolutionary history, what type of outgassing came from the interior. Um, we're going to you know, try to figure out if there is any geological activity left. Um, in, in Titan, if there are you know, there anything that we can measure with a seismometer, um, we're going to get really good composition measurements of the surface, the bulk surface composition. Um, all of these things are really going to help us answer the, the big picture questions that we have left about Titan, but um, those are big picture questions that we have um, you know, about how planets work in general. And so um, I was actually scrolling through the questions and somebody asked, I don't know if they were trolling me or what, if it's important to study uh, Europa and Enceladus and Titan. And I think, the, the, I, to me, the obvious answer to that is yes. I think, you know, regardless of which worlds we're studying, whether they're hot, they're hot Jupiters or super Earths or Europa, we're all trying to figure out how planets work. And the only way we're ever going to do that is by using all of the, the planets that, that we have the opportunity to observe um, to study them and figure out how they work individually so that we can figure out um, you know, how these processes work more broadly and what the real you know, physical and chemical underlying mechanisms are for how planets work. Thank you. Uh, by the way, you all got that question wrong. The correct answer was le voir. <laughs> <laughs> so, next, uh, we're going to move... Uh, Back to geology and uh, talking about plate tectonics, and this is something that you, of course, mentioned a lot. Uh, so uh, questions related to more detail about how we would infer that and how important is it? So um, I, I want to start off, I, I, I really liked how the question is phrased to begin with, which is what make, or what was the... It's, it, it, the question specifically is what makes a planet likely to have right. plate tectonics? So, I, I want to get this out of the way first, in that we don't know why the Earth has plate tectonics. And uh, that's, that's okay, it's an active area of research. But in terms of exoplanets, I said, oh, we should just figure out how to infer whether something has plate tectonics. It's an equally valid thing to infer whether it is unlikely to have plate tectonics. And that may actually be the easier problem in saying, this planets of this composition or this size, super Earths might have trouble doing it, or Mars sized things might have trouble doing it. Even just constraining what doesn't work tells us quite a bit. And so um, why it's important is, it comes from a, a variety of reasons. One is it really helps stabilizing long-term climate. Um, there's been a lot of work by Brad Foley and his collaborators looking at you know, how long you can maintain temperate climates on a planet with plate tectonics and a planet with a stagnant lid, sort of the opposite of plate tectonics. And stagnant lids can 
have temperate climates, but for much shorter time periods. So I brought up ages as well, is that so if you wanted to look around a very old star and you see signals that a stagnant lid shouldn't be putting out, it's a maybe a safe assumption that that planet has plate tectonics. Um, it's an inference, but it might tell you something. And so if we are looking for Earth-like planets, the thing that really makes the Earth really earthy is plate tectonics, and it's something maybe we should think about. And I'm sure you can speak more to the geochemical cycling aspect of it. Yeah, so I guess it's, it seems like it's, it's key for sustaining long-term geochemical cycles, but it would also be fantastically exciting if planets contrived other ways to do chemical cycling between the exterior and interior efficiently on long time scales. So I would, I'd want to kind of remain open-minded. I, I think that's the key, efficiently over long yeah. time scales. Which maybe is impossible, <laughs> yeah. um, other than through plate tectonics. But it would be cool to find a planet which appears to have managed to regulate aspects of its atmosphere, yet we think, we, from all other reasons, we think maybe plate tectonics is unlikely on that planet. Um, from a kind of observational perspective, I might kind of come back to this idea of, of kind of monitoring, if you can you can indulge in looking at a single object for a protracted period of time or just get incredibly lucky and see, see transients, then, then volcanism is, a, is kind of a, a product or a particular type of volcanism is a product of plate tectonics on Earth, whereby it kind of drags cold, wet material into the interior of the planet, which can then release its water and it can be incorporated in volcanic eruptions. And so those kind of explosive wet eruptions are possibly a kind of unique byproduct of Earth-like plate tectonics. Um, so if you saw one of those occurring, that would be kind of an exciting um, signature of tectonic-like process. And I want to mention, too, that this idea of theoretical earth science is totally new. You know, earth science, we're mm -hmm. used to studying the earth. Even asking the question, what does a planet look like with or without plate tectonics in a, in a vacuum is a very tough question for a geoscientist to wrap their brain around. And so we in the geoscience community have to think outside of our earth-biased box and think almost, almost like an astronomer and broad thinking and un trying to predict trends or populations that will help us understand what plate tectonics looks or doesn't look like. One thing that I think is really interesting about what you just said is that, um, you know, I think the universe is more creative than, than we are. And so, um, you know, if, you know, it comes up sometimes, is plate tectonics required for life? Is that why Earth has life and the other? Is there, is there something about plate tectonics, like you just said, this geochemical cycling, that a planet could do in a different way? that is really the thing that's fundamental. And one thing I think that we have learned from the solar system is that you can have connections between different bodies that can sometimes mimic some of these same things. So one of the, one of the ways in which Titan's atmosphere maintains its disequilibrium is the example I already gave, Enceladus. But that's not the only example we have in the solar system. We also have Io and Europa. And so if Europa turns out to be inhabited, it's possible that part of the reason for that is because Io is helping it maintain its disequilibrium by sending it material there. And so you know, I think we have to start thinking more creatively about ways in which planets might be able to mimic these things that we think are required, but by doing them in a completely different way. Yeah. And maybe that's even more relevant if we're kind of in the next decade or so looking at M-dwarf system, like incredibly compact multi-planet systems, mm -hmm. then like the lessons from the kind of the moon systems right. in our solar system mm -hmm. suddenly become very analogous maybe to like the Trappist-1 type, mm -hmm. type system. Okay, so now I want to uh, go back to atmospheres. Uh, there's a question about hazes and cloud compositions and how important uh, it is in order to be able to understand the composition of clouds and hazes. And uh, the question specifically is in the next 10 to 20 years, how well do you think that haze cloud composition and size distribution will be able to be observationally constrained? I mean, you know, I think Webb is going to do a lot for us in terms of that. Um, in terms of trying to figure out, you know, size distribution and composition, um, these things can can be intertwined a little bit. Um, but having, you know, decent spectra over a relatively broad wavelength range is what you really need to start to think about, you know, things like what size are the particles in this atmosphere and what are they made out of. Um, that said, we've been studying Titan. Um, spectroscopically since 1940, if you want to be generous, and we still don't really know what the haze particles are made out of other than their organic 
So congratulations to us. We've really made <laughs> some, some, some big strides there. Um, but then the question you know, that you're always needing to ask yourself in that scenario is, well, does it, how much does it matter whether or not you know the composition? And so I think you know, the first step is just going to be figuring out, you know, in a lot of these atmospheres, we see the signature of an aerosol absorber. We don't even know if it's clouds or haze. Um, and so, you know, step one is, are these clouds? Um, are those clouds that are indicative of some kind of volatile cycling on that planet? Or are these just simple, simple condensates? Um, which will obviously depend in some way on the type of planet that it is. Um, but I don't think we really have a good sense of how strongly it will depend on that. Um, but I think that, you know, that's going to be somewhere where we're going to start to make a lot of progress. And I think, you know, the lesson from the solar system is, you know, we'll start to figure out the atmospheres first because um, they're in the way. I know my colleagues who study <laughs> services hate the atmospheres. <laughs> the thing that I love most in life is in the way of what they're trying to figure out. Um, yes, there is a great sense at the moment that clouds and hazes on exoplanets produce these boring flat spectra, and they just get in the way of things. Really. I, I, and I feel like people who, who, who feel that way, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely um, sympathetic to your cause, have never really looked at a broad wavelength spectrum of Titan before. Um, because Titan is pretty darn hazy and cloudy. Titan has like 10 different types of clouds, just to be really obnoxious. Um, mm -hmm. And we still get really, really beautiful composition measurements that we've been able to do from remote sensing. And I know Titan's closer and, and all of those things, but um, you know, if you're looking at a broad wavelength range, um, those particles aren't gonna get in the way everywhere. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, now I'm going to move to another question. We've been getting a lot of questions, by the way. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so this question is about hot Earth-sized planets. So of course, the current uh, techniques of radial velocity and transit method are biased towards short period planets. Uh, and in the era of tests, we're finding a lot of uh, potentially terrestrial planets which are close to their stars. And the question is, uh, what do those kinds of planets have the potential to reveal uh, regarding their geology and atmospheres uh, that more temperate cousins cannot? Yeah, I, I, so I think, yeah, one of the really exciting things about finding planets in these kind of new regimes, which we don't have maybe analogs for in the solar system, whether that be a regime of proximity to their host star and therefore kind of temperature, or new regime in terms of size, and so super Earths, is this question of right, what are the limits of geology? At what point do the geological processes we are familiar with kind of break down and stop happening, and the planets shift into a, a different regime? And in a sense, maybe Earth, Venus, is there's clearly a fun, uh, geophysically or geodynamically, there's a big regime shift there. Um, we don't know whether that's kind of hardwired into being that little bit closer, or whether that's just coincidence in this case. Um, so, I think, yeah, that maybe the second slide I showed kind of this question of, um, of, of magma oceans being something uh, potentially a really key state kind of chemically and dynamically in the evolution of a planet, which they could pass through extremely rapidly in the case of Earth maybe, but could be trapped in, in that state long term. Though planets in, in that regime um, would be incredibly interesting to study. So what are the chemical, and I know there, there are papers on this, what are the chemical cycles that emerge in, in a molten planet between its atmosphere and its interior, and how is that teaching us about how Earth perhaps gained its atmosphere or, or lost bits of its atmosphere, which it needed to lose to be the kind of relatively dry, but not totally dry planet that it became um, for life then to emerge on it? I, I think of uh, a bit of a different angle for this, which is if you're a, a close-in Earth-sized planet, and let's say you're tidally locked, and you're getting tidally distorted, and you're adding heat to that interior, that actually tells you, some, you actually now have a sense of how much heat is going into that planet, and that actually can help you in your models to maybe understand what volcanism you see, whether it is molten the, the entire time. Um, and then we don't really have any observational or even theoretical, yeah, uh, models to understand what a long-term magma ocean planet looks like. I, I, we, we actually have very little sense of the Earth's own magma ocean, so being able to test that very fundamental phase of Earth-sized planets would be really remarkable. And in principle, if you're small enough and close enough, such that you have a cometary dust oh, tail, okay. that also gives yeah. you a direct probe of 
the material of the planet as well. Yeah, D disintegrating planets is uh, going to, is very interesting because yeah, if your crust, which is very highly processed at geologic material, if you get a sense of that composition, you can maybe backtrack out what the whole planet is made of. We do that in the solar system a lot. Okay, so uh, now I want all of you to speculate a little more. Earlier we had a question about what your dream uh, instrument uh, would be, but there was an interesting question by Zach Bader Thompson uh, that was asking about what experiments can we do in the lab? What can we do here uh, that would really help inform our studies of exoplanets? So I, I'm, I am a very big advocate for experimental exoplanets, um, particularly when we get to um, the pressures and temperatures indicative of super-Earths, which is well beyond things we have measured in the lab because we didn't have the reason to because the Earth is only so big. Um, that non-Earth compositions, um, I, li I like to say that every planet from Mars to a super-Earth has an upper mantle. It's from one bar to 25 GPA. You have to go through that mineralogy that is indicative of upper mantle. The, it'd be naive to think that every upper mantle is exactly Earth composition. So we can study the melt behavior, the, this, the visc viscosity, uh, conductivity, the really fundamental things we need to know for geoscience. Um, in the lab already, we have the technology in hand from 50 to 100 years of doing it for the Earth um, to build this kind of catalog of upper mantle possibilities. That's where all the action's gonna happen in terms of atmosphere production, secondary atmosphere production or geochemical cycling or continents. And you know, we, ha we have a whole geoscience community really wanting to, to work on this. And it's just a matter of getting it funded and figuring out where to start. And Anyone else? Yeah. For bigger planets, um, I mean, water and hydrogen are two of the most abundant planet-forming materials. And there are still big uncertainties on the equation of state of hydrogen-water mixtures. Um, there are some recent uh, experimental evidence that hydrogen and water can become immiscible at pressures, uh, we have experiments up to about two gigapascal or so, but even mapping that out and reconciling that with um, ab initio kind of density functional theory calculation so that we can understand uh, in what cases would we expect the volatile envelopes of mini Neptunes or even giant planets to be potentially well mixed or in what cases would we expect uh, uh, hydrogen and helium and water to kind of separate out in two separate phases? I guess as an experimentalist, am I allowed to answer my work? <laughs> <laughs> we already have dragonflies. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of work already being done in support of, a lot of experimental work already being done in support of exoplanets, and, and some of it is stuff that's really fundamental that really needs to be done, and I think that you know, a lot of people in this room know that very well. I mean, we need line lists, we need you know, phase diagrams, we need all of these things we never in a million years thought we were going to need because the, the phase space doesn't exist in the solar system, and so the measurements were never done. Um, some of that phase space is really experimentally challenging, um, the rest of it, the only challenge to getting the measurements is getting funding. Um, but there's also more complicated experiments that, that can be done. Um, you know, some of the work that, that my group is doing is simulating atmospheric chemistry, but there's people who are you know, simulating um, you know, water-rock interactions. We, you know, earlier uh, this morning, people were talking about you know, methane as a fluid, and we have all these different solvents, and um, you know, starting to think about those complex um, systems and, and what happens when, when water is not your solvent. Um, what happens when you're at 800 Kelvin? I mean, all of these things, you know, need to be done, and and until they're done in the lab, um, we're never fully going to understand the observational data that come from exoplanets. And um, you know, this is this has been a huge barrier, I think, to trying to understand the solar system. I always tell the story: we didn't have going into Cassini, we didn't have a good propane line list. Propane's relatively mm -hmm. common, um, but because of all of its bonds. Um, it's basically like skunkweed, there's lines everywhere. And about 
uh, eight years into the mission, somebody finally got funding to measure a propane line list. And within a week, they had detected a new molecule in Cassini data that had been taken for years and years and years. Because propane was everywhere, and it was sitting on top of, um, on top of a C3H6 line. And so as soon as, as soon as they had the data, done. Discovery, write the paper. Um, and so you know, we, we fight that in the solar system all the time, and it's only going to be worse for exoplanets. Yeah, yeah, the kind of expansion of the, the phase space in which the planets are operating is is kind of both a massive opportunity and challenge for laboratory um, experimentalists. And so, yeah, so experimental petrology in particular, looking at the physical properties and, th you know, produ producing the, calibrating the thermodynamics that allows us to model volcanic degassing or magma ocean degassing or atmosphere, magma ocean equilibration. Um, you know, that's a huge potential phase space, which the experiments are kind of challenging, costly, time consuming. And, now we have even more reason to, to do them and explore the phase space. So that's one, ex that's one exciting thing. And the other thing I'd say is if I was allowed to take liberty with what lab means and consider <laughs> Earth as, as a lab, then I think work looking at how on Earth water interacts with, with rock, um, the chemical cycling, the, kind of the weathering of the continents, the weathering of the seafloor, the, kind of, you know, the classic geosciences that's being done today to investigate how those processes work has whether I guess people, the people that do it realize it or not, in, like, immediate and interesting applications for understanding the habitability of, of, of kind of terrestrial planet. And, and on that, for the Earth as a lab, I, I completely agree. And the, the classic example I, I like to bring up is that we don't know, we don't have a census of all the gases coming out of every volcano on the Earth, or which one are the biggest contributors or the smallest contributors. It's just, it hasn't been done. It's a huge problem. So we, we don't even know how much is going down into the mantle at plate boundaries. So we don't have a sense of the own global geochemical cycling on the planet because we've just never had a reason, well, maybe not a reason, but we just haven't done a census of those processes. OK, next is a question which is very dear to my heart. God bless whoever asked this question. <laughs> uh, is understanding why the Earth and Venus are so different more crucial than any exoplanet investigation? In fact, it's... Uh, it's a statement. Did really. you ask this question? <laughs> <laughs> it's anonymous. Well, so it could um, be you, since it was anonymous. <laughs> but, um, well, let me put a, a slightly extra spin on this, which is that often when we look at potential exoplanet analogs with our, within our solar system, we often ignore the axis of time, which is to say that we look at all the planets in our solar system in their present state, and then we run with, the, with those. However, if we were to observe our solar system at an age of two giga years, we may well conclude that there are two planets with surface liquid water, and uh, that would change dramatically our, uh, our, our feelings of, of the relationship between surface liquid water and the size of the planet. Now, their uh, evolution has obviously dramatically diverged. So, um, how important is it that we that, that we understand completely that difference? I mean, I think anything we do is important. So the question is, <laughs> what question are you trying to answer? Um, and so I think it would depend on the question, which thing you would think is the most important to do first, if that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, I do think that you know anything we learn about the solar system is going to be helpful for understanding exoplanets, and anything we learn about exoplanets is going to be helpful for under understanding the solar system. And I think um, one of my biggest frustrations, and actually I think one of the biggest hurdles that we have to figure out as various communities t uh, to overcome is how to actually like really properly work together. Um, and you know not treat it as solar system and exoplanets, but just, planets, period. We're trying to figure them out. And we have lots of different ways now in which we can study them. And that, I think, is really exciting. This is a hugely exciting time to be a planetary scientist. Um, and so I think sometimes we get in this dichotomy of like, well, should we do the solar system thing first, or should we do the exo? Like, I don't think it actually really matters. I mean, if you really need like one specific question answered, then probably there's a right way to do it. Um, but I think you know both of those things are hugely important. My response would be that for all the different various theories and possibilities, you, 
the possible explanations for the dichotomy between Venus and Earth, if you can then come up with observables for exoplanets where you could test those theories, that's almost more important uh, than having a definitive answer, but rather developing a framework and doing the work in advance to figure out how many exoplanets would you need to characterize the atmospheres of, to actually be able to rule in or rule out, or have evidence to substantiate or to disfavor different uh, ideas about how the uh, Earth-Venus dichotomy arose. I, I really agree with you when you said about how, how important time is in this and how we have our snapshot of the present, but if we could look, look back in the past, maybe a gig year even, given the potentially young surface age of Venus, we, we'd see a different solar system, or at least a different inner solar system. And this, which reminds me that in terms of that kind of uh, observational kind of wish list, maybe something which would be great is uh, really precise uh, system age. It would be great to know the age of systems very precisely from a kind of geological perspective, that being such a key axis, an axis of variability. Um, but coming back to this particular question, I think you know, the utility of Venus really comes down to can we, can we, if we were to get to that planet, can we see into its past in the, in the surface that's available to us for study? And my guess would be that the risk in the case of Venus is that in the geological processes that have occurred in the last gig year or so potentially obliterated a lot of that history. Um, and maybe it is there, um, and we could get it, we could see it, or maybe it's not. But that would be the kind of the coin you're flipping by, by going to Venus. And if, if it's not there, then, yeah, then the utility of that object for, for understanding the, that dichotomy between Earth and Venus is much less, much less useful. And exoplanets actually then fill that gap by sampling time um, more completely. I, I think to uh, this question of we're going to be measuring exoplanet composition, maybe. We actually don't know Venus's composition. And I jokingly always say, whenever, what do we want to measure for Venus? I just want to know the size of its core, because we don't know that. Um, we have guesses, but if the Earth and Venus are the same composition, that's actually a really interesting constraint on formation models of how well mixed was the inner disk when the planets were forming. Um, and so, yeah, knowing something as simple as how much iron it has can tell us a lot about the history, even though you just, but it's a really hard measurement. Um, you either put a seismometer on it or you get a, a moment of inertia. Both are really tough. Well, that's the segue uh, into the final question I think we'll have time for, which is a question by Joshua Pepper, who uh, asks, and this is going right back now in terms of formation history. So uh, as, as you all know, uh, there is still multiple scenarios regarding planet formation, particularly in the early stages and the migration of Jupiter and Saturn, the formation of Mars, uh, and how important is it that we have a concise understanding of solar system formation in the context of exoplanets? So I, I, I think I, 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 like, I like, always liked this question, and I always flip it on my head, and I flip it on its head, which is how different would the Earth be if we didn't have Jupiter? You know, it, so if you're looking for Earth-like planets, do you need a Jupiter? That's uh, those kinds of questions, and so. Um, it, it's the formation is you know maybe setting your initial conditions and that and then geology or other things take over and push it through time. But the initial condition of a planet is a maybe a boundary condition. We at least need to know that so we can extrapolate through time. Yeah, I guess the maybe the answer is we don't we don't really know because yeah. we we don't know how contingent the evolution of I guess either Earth, Mars, Venus, or any of the planets in the solar system is upon those initial conditions and. Maybe really what we need is we need exoplanet with diversity of exoplanetary systems, maybe some of which are solar system like or some of which are similar to each other but different from others that actually are going to enable us to kind of look for those correlations whereby you know present system architecture maps into you know this type of atmosphere on this type of planet at this distance. We really kind of I mean that would be my perspective on formation is to try and that big question mark over contingency in planetary evolution, we can use the exoplanetary kind of demographics to begin trying to answer that for us, to even know whether or not formation matters. Maybe planets are really effective at rehabilitating themselves out of some pretty nasty starting conditions. 
Um, and again, maybe the end dwarfs in the next decade will be a good kind of insight into that as to how, how effective rehabilitation is for some planets. Although not for the specific question of how the presence or absence of a Jupiter analog affects planets in the habitable zone. For that, I mean, since there's a bit of a dearth of Jovian planets around M dwarfs, for that, we really would want Louvoir and Habex into a direct imaging mission that would be able to both characterize the atmospheres of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone, but also the outer architectures of those systems as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this issue of the starting conditions, I think, is a really big deal. I mean, the, the Ganymede Titan example that I used earlier, you know, one possible explanation for the reason why they look that way is the timing of the acquisition of Titan's atmosphere con compared to the timing of, of the migration of the planets. And so that could just be it. That's it. Like, and we're done. Like, problem solved. Um, and so that would be really important to know. But I think, um, you know, this issue of, of, of rehabilitation is interesting, too. I love, um, and I can't remember what the context was at this point, but many years ago, I was listening to Dave Grinspoon give a talk, and he said, planets are more like people than protons. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is that their history really matters to what they look like when we observe them. And so I think in that sense, if we really want to understand the solar system and start being able to apply the things that we have learned from the solar system to extrasolar planets, we really need to know what the actual starting conditions were and how much variation there was. How much did the planets really move in the disk and what did that do to them? There's heating involved in that. There's compositional changes involved in doing that. And all of those things potentially matter for the state that we see now, but we don't know that for sure. And I think if we're looking for observables, we don't have a forward model to even think of what the observables would be. So, yeah, it could be that this just lives in modeling theory for forever, but we don't know the observables we, we can't think of. So, but we need a model to kind of get the framework to start thinking about these questions. Well, on that discouraging note, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's all we have time for on this panel. But thank you all, those of you present here and those online for your questions. And uh, let's all thank the panel. <laughs>